Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kelly Cheney and I'm one of the assistant directors here with Child Nutrition and Wellness and joining me today is Laura Hodgson who is a CACFP Summer Food Service Program Consultant and a consultant of many talents that also helps with uh, uh, sponsoring organizations participate in uh, our child nutrition programs as well as procurement. So um, we appreciate the opportunity to share information with you about uh, optimizing student wellness and learning through year-round meal services. There is a lot of research um, that supports nutrition and academics and um, it's very well known that students who experience food insufficiency uh, tend to have lower math scores and um, young children who become overweight between kindergarten and at, the, and at the end of third grade experience reductions in test scores and that regular weight and overweight, so children that are not obese, um, at, at nutritional risk have lower math scores, poor attendance, and more behavioral problems. I also want to note that there's a lot of research regarding breakfast consumption and uh, absenteeism, cognitive ability, uh, and uh, improvements on uh, test scores, and we'll talk a little bit about that as um, we go along. Okay, and um, so let's go ahead and um, let's just talk a little bit about um, students and how much time they spend in school and out of school. Um, you'll see on this slide we have a pie chart and I was really surprised at this because I have um, I have a son who uh, recently graduated from high school and I thought for sure he was probably spending at least 60% of his days in school. But according to this chart, um, we have students that are only spending about 49% of their days uh, in school. So what that basically means is there are a lot of opportunities for schools and other sponsoring organizations to provide access to healthy meals to students when school is not in session. And you can see that the bulk of um, days outside of the school day um, occurs on uh, weekends during the school year, so about 23%. And then we have our summer weekdays as well at 14%. So some of the things that the, the programs that we're going to talk to you about today and the meal service opportunities include the after school, after school meals option, uh, summer meals, and then innovative, innovative breakfast options. Because we know that in order to, to keep students um, healthy and thriving and performing well in school academically, mentally, physically, um, that uh, good nutrition helps support that. And again, there are a lot of opportunities for schools to either provide access to uh, meals year round or to collaborate with other sponsoring organizations to create access to meals year round. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura and she is going to um, talk to you about after school meal options. Yeah, thank you. So we have a couple different options for sponsors to be able to serve meals or snacks after the school day. Uh, so I'm going to go through the after school snack program uh, just a tad and then I'm going to focus on the at risk after school meals. And then there is a third option that I'll just touch on briefly and that's the outside school hours care center option that's also through CACFP. So we'll go through each one of those. All right, so the at-risk after-school meals program is run through the Child and Adult Care Food Program. So this is uh, a separate program, a uh, separate child nutrition program. We have our own set of regulations. And what, what the at-risk after-school meals program offers uh, sponsors to be able to serve is up to one snack and one meal per day uh, after the school day. Uh, so that expands your options for being able to serve um, not only a snack, but if you're interested and see the need in your community to be able to serve a full meal. Um, now, uh, qualifying sites 
are within a school boundary that is at least 50% free and reduced. And if your uh, site qualifies, um, then you can participate on the program and all of those meals and snacks would be paid at our CACFP free rate of reimbursement, which would be the highest rate of reimbursement for CACFP. School sponsors uh, would be allowed to use either the CACFP meal pattern or their NSLP or uh, breakfast meal pattern. Uh, I will say that most of the sponsors that participate on at risk, if they're doing a, a, a full meal, they choose to do our CACFP meal pattern. It is a component based meal pattern, so it's pretty straightforward and you can see there what the uh, the five components of a lunch or a supper would include. Uh, you have milk, you have a meat, meat alternate, uh, you have bread and grains, you have a vegetable, and you have a fruit. So it would be a five, five component meal. The meals or the snacks uh, would be served any time after the school day, any day during the school year. So this is a school year only program and uh, meals and snacks could be served on school day outs anytime during the school year as well. So on your school breaks, uh, spring break, winter breaks, any other school day outs, you can serve meals and snacks and those could be served anytime during the day. So if you wanted to, you could actually serve a breakfast and then a snack or you could continue doing uh, just a snack or just a supper. It's any combination of up to one snack and one meal uh, anytime on a school day out. If it's on a school day, it must be after the school day is over. Some additional information about the at-risk after school meals. There's another component and that is that the school must provide some sort of educational or enrichment activity. Uh, so a lot of times that would include tutoring, it may be different activities that the students are participating in after their school day, uh, like different clubs. Uh, you, can do you can include athletic programs, uh, the sports teams. However, if you do that, you do have to ensure that uh, meals are offered to everyone in the school that would be there after their school day. Uh, there is no requirement that students have to participate in those um, activities. As long as there are activities offered for anyone, uh, then the student could come and get the snack or the meal. And if they choose so, then they can leave after they have consumed their snack on site. They do not have to participate in the actual activity. Uh, like I said, the meals must be consumed on the school grounds. Uh, they can be taken anywhere on the school grounds um, if the school chooses to allow that. So if they wanted to uh, pick up their snack or their meal and take it to another classroom, that would be okay. Or if they wanna take it out to the football field, that would be okay, but it needs to be consumed on the school grounds. Uh, the documentation requirements that we have for at-risk at after-school meals is pretty standard. Uh, we do require, though, however, uh, that there be both an attendance and a meal count record. Uh, so the attendance would be whether or not the student comes through the, uh, the program to get the meal uh, or either comes through the program to participate in the activity. Um, and then the meal count is whether or not they actually received the meal or the snack. So there's two different pieces of documentation there. Um, some of our schools choose, as attendants, they choose to just have their uh, students sign themselves on a roster, so they're just signing their name. That works. Or you can have two different columns on your roster, one to show attendance and one to show the meal count. So there's different ways that you can collect that documentation. And then, of course, you would have your menus and then your meal production records. And uh, we are flexible on meal production records. If you choose to use the same production records that you're using for uh, your school programs, that is perfectly fine. We do have uh, templates that are available. 
uh, that we use for CACFP. You can look at those and use those if you would like. Uh, but somehow the, uh, the actual food prepared should be documented through production records. And then if you have more than one site participating with at risk, you would have to comply with our monitoring requirements, which basically is um, doing site visits at each one of the sites. Uh, we require three visits per year. Um, however, if, if the site is also a summer food service site, um, there is some flexibility there as far as being able to use um, a visit during the summer to comply with our requirements. We do have training for the at-risk program available on our KSDE training portal. So that can be accessed anytime, anywhere. And then we also, of course, have consultants available um, that we can provide specific technical assistance for you. Um, and you would have your, uh, your consultant that would be assigned to your sponsor to work with you on this program as well. Any questions about the at-risk after-school meals? Okay, so that's the program that is through the Child and Adult Care Food Program. And then there's the option of the after school snack program. And this is an option that is available through the NSLP. Um, again, in, in an, either an area eligible area that's over 50%, or you can qualify the site based on individual eligibility. Um, now, a distinction between the at risk and after school snack is that. Uh, the only way to qualify for an at-risk site through CACFP is through the school data. That is the your only method of qualification. With the uh, after-school snack program, you're only able to claim one snack. Um, so you don't have the supper option through this. Um, but what it does allow sponsors to do is it allows you to just continue uh, claiming these meals <clears throat> through the National School Lunch Program. Um, so you would not actually switch over into a different program. Um, also, you do have to provide um, some sort of a regularly scheduled education or enrichment activity similar to the at-risk program. All right, and then your last option for after-school meals is something that we don't often talk about. Um, it is also a program that is through the CACFP, and it's called Outside School Hours Care. And basically, this is an option for sites that do not qualify as an area eligible site, uh, which means that if your school or area does not have over 50% free and reduced, uh, then you can participate as a, an outside school hours care site um, it is a little bit more um, labor intensive as far as documentation because uh, in order to determine reimbursement, we are now looking at the individual eligibility of the students, um, which if you're being a school, you would already have that information likely on file. Um, so that is how you would determine reimbursement. Uh, we reimburse based on a claiming percentage with CACFP, uh, so those uh, meals and snacks would be reimbursed at the appropriate uh, reimbursement rate, depending on the percentage of your students that are in each of our um, categories. We do follow the CACFP regulations with this program, and actually what that allows you to do is if you wanted to, you could serve up to two meals and one snack per day. And again, this is outside of their school hours, so for sites it would actually allow you to um, claim before the school day starts, after the school day starts, and then it would allow you to claim, of course, on school day outs, and then um, we'll talk about summer here in a minute, but then it would also allow a site, if you don't qualify, you could actually then claim meals and or snacks during the summer with this program. So it would be a year-round program anytime the students are not in school. So that is an option if you have a site that does not qualify based on the area eligibility. Okay, questions about the after school options? I'm going to let Kelly take it over and talk about after schools out. Yeah, thank you, Laura. All right, so we have, um, is, it, 
at least in my opinion, some really great options for uh, providing access to healthy meals during the school year when school is out. And um, now we want to move on and talk about um, the rest of the year uh, because I don't I don't think anybody is going to argue that children need access to healthy meals when school is not in session. Hunger doesn't take a vacation like they say, um, and we know that when children have access to healthy meals, they are able to participate in programming and enrichment op opportunities, that this helps prevent what we Call the summer slide, and it our programs like the summer food service program, and even would be an out outside of school hours. Yes. That was a mouthful. Um, those both of those options would would do just that. Um, so child nutrition and wellness can help school sponsors and other organizations provide access to those healthy meals and snacks um, from May to August. So something to think about. So our summer meal service options, we're going to focus on, um, the, on these three options, the summer food service program, the seamless summer option, and then the continuation of school nutrition programs. And a lot of our school sponsors don't realize that you can actually continue the school nutrition program during the summer. Um, so three very viable options um, depending on the needs of your school and the needs of your children. So first off, the Summer Food Service Program. It is what we call a community nutrition program. It falls within that uh, community nutrition program area just as the child and adult care food program does. And it is based on um, site eligibility. Um, I would say that about 90% of all the meal service sites participating in the Summer Food Service Program are what we call uh, an open site. So what that means is is the meal service sites are located um, in an area eligible location and every single child coming to that meal service site can get the, receive a meal for free. We do also have some special types of open sites, um, programs that, pri that um, predominantly serve children of migrant workers are um, a special type of open site. And one of the, the unique things about uh, migrant meal service sites um, is that they can actually, these sites can provide a breakfast, a lunch, and a supper to the same children on the same day whereas all other open sites can only provide access um, to two meals or two snacks. Um, so, so that is, is certainly a, a great option um, for sites that are serving uh, predominantly migrant children. The other option is, is if, if a sponsoring organization um, wants to operate a meal service site that is not located in an area eligible location, uh, they can uh, operate what we call an enrolled meal service site. And so this meal service site is not open to the public at large. It's only open to the enrolled children of the program or to an identified group of children. Now, what I do want to say here, though, is it's kind of a, like a hybrid uh, type of, of meal service site. As long as 50% of the children that are enrolled at this site qualify for free or reduced price school meals, then all of the children uh, can receive the meal for free and the sponsoring organization can claim all of those meals served to all of the children um, for reimbursement. So there's a couple of options. There's actually even more options than what, we, that, what we're showing up here on the screen. Um, so if you're interested in participating in the Summer Food Service Program after this webinar is over, but you're not really sure that the meal service site's location that you want to operate may qualify, give our office a call and we can talk about what some other options are. So with the Summer Food Service Program, um, it is um, available to sponsoring organizations that have the ability to manage a food service program. And such organizations can be, of course, schools, also local government agencies, public agencies, private nonprofit organizations, universities or colleges, faith-based faith groups, libraries. The, the, the main criteria is that the sponsoring organization has to be a nonprofit organization in order to participate in the Summer Food Service Program. 
And so the Summer Food Service Program is available to all children between the ages of 1 and 18, and all meals are free to the children. And participation is recorded as a head count or a tally. So for those of you who are familiar with the school nutrition programs and with CACFP, um, there is the, you're keeping track of the individual students, uh, their names, um, when they receive a meal. And in the summer food service program, you are not doing that. You are keeping as it says, a head count or a tally of the children uh, that uh, participate in the meal service that receive a reimbursable meal. And there's only one rate in the summer food service program, and that is basically a free rate. Um, so uh, anyway, as long as the meal is reimbursable and the, uh, the child is eligible to participate, meaning they're between the ages of 1 and 18, then the meal can be claimed uh, for reimbursement from Kansas State Department of Education. So I kind of touched upon this um, just a second ago, but up to two meals a day may be served. And the great thing about this program is it's the sponsor that is deciding what meals uh, to serve and when to serve. And you, the sponsoring organization can pick a combination of two meals or two snacks from either breakfast, a, a morning or an a.m. snack, lunch, a p.m. snack, or supper. And meals can be served seven days a week, even on the weekends. Uh, and so, as the slide says at the bottom, site serving migrant children can serve up to three meals per day. Now, one of the things that I do want to mention here is that there is a little caveat um, for all sites except sites primarily serving migrant children and then for residential camps. Uh, and though, and, and the sites um, can only, cannot serve a lunch and a supper on the same day to the same children. But if, for instance, they wanted to serve lunch and breakfast on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they wanted to serve a supper meal to the children, they could do that. But there is a cap on the number and the, the meal combination, specifically speaking to lunch and supper, um, with the exception of those sites that primarily serve migrant children in our residential camps. So, and of course, with this being a federal child nutrition program, the meals must meet the USDA minimum meal uh, requirements. And this is just a, a nice short and sweet table that shows the, the meal pattern requirements for breakfast, for lunch and supper, and then for a snack. And these are very simple meal patterns. Um, for breakfast, uh, the minimum amount that uh, has to be served is one grain bread, which is basically a small muffin, a half a cup of fruit, vegetable or full strength juice, and then eight ounces of, of fluid milk. So that's a pretty simple meal to prepare and to serve to the children. I do want to say though that you can serve more food to children and, and, and uh, sponsoring organizations are encouraged to do that at their meal service sites if they have meal service sites that are serving older um, students. So those in high school or junior high, obviously um, a muffin, a half a cup of fruit, and eight ounces of milk um, may not be as filling for a 16-year-old who, who participates in athletics as compared to a uh, three-year-old. Um, so just know that there you can provide additional food, but there is no additional reimbursement for um, the food outside of the minimum uh, meal pattern requirements. So lunch and supper, two ounces of meat or meat meat alternate, three-fourths cut fruit, vegetable or juice from two sources, one grain bread and eight ounces of anti-fluid milk. So what this could look like is it could be a ham and cheese sandwich and say a fourth a cup of um, grapes and a half a cup of carrot sticks and eight ounces of fluid milk, and that's a, a reimbursable meal, potentially. Um, and then snacks, just a, a, a combination of any of the two components. We, we use the word components in our child nutrition programs, but uh, you can think of components as food groups. Some of you remember the, the old food guide pyramid. Um, 
you can you can liken the component terminology to a food group. So one ounce of meat, meat alternate, three-fourths cup fruit, vegetable, or full-strength juice. And actually, three-fourths cup of full-strength juice is actually six ounces. So I think the Juicy Juice brand makes a uh, six-ounce juice container. I'm sure there's probably a lot of others. I probably shouldn't mention name brands. Uh, a grain bread, that is as simple as either a small muffin or a slice of bread, and then eight ounces of fluid milk. The half pints that you see in the schools, that is is eight ounces. So again, not a, a, a lot of food that is required um, to be served to meet the minimum uh, minimum requirements, but certainly you can uh, serve more food. And one of the things that I want to mention too is that um, the food served in this program does not have to be hot. It can be cold. Um, so uh, the example that I gave with lunch, that ham and cheese sandwich, carrot sticks, grapes, and milk, that is fine. Um, but we also have a lot of school sponsors that uh, participate in the summer food service program and they do like to serve hot meals uh, they like to take the the favorite hot meals from the from the school nutrition programs during the school year and incorporate those into their summer food service program menus. So there's a lot of flexibility there. It depends on the meal service site locations and the facilities, the food preparation facilities that you have access to, as well as the, the food preferences of the children. And so we've got on this slide some pictures of the summer food service program. Uh, we've, you can see that um, there are some, some maybe some uh, pictures up here that maybe you might not traditionally think Think of serve as being meal service sites. We have um, over to the far left, we have the, I believe it's called the, the park and pool, and this is in Chanute, and this is a trailer that they um, that they uh, pull around to various locations in the city of Chanute, and they serve meals in parks and um, uh, in various locations throughout the community. And then on the bottom, the bottom center, that is the uh, food truck for Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools. And you can see that the two children in this picture are receiving a, a packaged meal um, from the, the staff member. And then over to the, the right, we have, the, uh, this is actually a sports complex in Osawatomie. And um, they serve a supper meal here at the, the sports complex. It's the only one. I in the state of Kansas, and I believe possibly maybe still in the nation. So that's very exciting. And then in the, the center, the top center of the screen, um, you can see what appears to be a school cafeteria. And we've got um, some two little girls in this picture that look very happy and they're very excited about the nutrition education activity that they just participated in. So the, what we're trying to get across here, and this is not only for the summer food service program, but also to Laura, would you not agree in at risk? There is some flexibility for at risk after school meals. You don't have to, it doesn't always have to be at a school site. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. We, um, we just approved a, a literacy bus mm -hmm. to uh, participate in the literacy bus. Right now, I think um, it only has two, is that right? Yeah, so they take it to two, two different locations in the town, and they, so each location uh, qualifies based on the mm -hmm. school boundary. So it's the same bus, but it serves as two different sites. Uh, because they take it to two, two different locations. Yeah, yeah. And that's very, very similar to to the pictures that yeah. you see here in the summer food service program. So that's very exciting. So I think, I guess, I guess, we're kind of thinking outside of the box and thinking of uh, of non traditional meal service options. Okay, so now let's move on to our second summer meal option, and this is the seamless summer option. And I always describe this meal service option as it's a hybrid meal service option. And it's, it takes um, the features, I think, um, the, the best features of the summer food service program and the school nutrition program, and it rolls those best features into this program called the Seamless Summer Option. And so this is only for school sponsors to participate in. Um, and it provides free meals to all children in low income areas. So the school has to uh, be an area in an area eligible location. And, in, uh, and any children coming to that meal service site can receive the meal for free. However, uh, participation in this program, the reimbursement is, is the reimbursement rates 
uh, that are those of the school nutrition programs for lunch and for breakfast. Whereas the summer food service program that we just talked about, it has its own set of reimbursement rates and those rates are actually a little bit higher because there's extra money uh, provided in the reimbursement rate for administrative um, expenses. Now, um, with this, the reimbursement is the, at the free uh, school nutrition, or excuse me, school lunch and school breakfast rates. And this, of course, is offered um, during traditional summer vacation, May through August. Um, and the meals are free to, to free of charge to all the children 18 years of age and younger um, or 18 years of age and over who participate during the school year in a public or private school program. And I do want to say, though, that that actually, there is a word left out of there. That is persons 18 years of age and over with disabilities who participate during the school year in a public or private school program. So, um, and up to two meals per day may be served, and it's a combination of a breakfast, lunch, a supper, an AM snack, or a PM snack. And then um, the policies that, that guide the, the school lunch and school breakfast program also guide the seamless summer meal option. The school uh, lunch and school breakfast meal patterns do have to be followed. Um, sponsors can implement offer or be a serve program. And of course, then you can choose to serve one to two meals per day. And migrant and campsites can serve up to three meals per day here. So again, you'll, you'll see that it takes, it takes again, the, the, the best features of the school nutrition programs and the summer food service program. And locations uh, of meal service sites could be schools, parks, um, located within uh, the, uh, the facilities of a nonprofit organization. Meal service sites can be open, restricted open, closed enrolled. They can be camp sites and they can be migrant sites. So a lot more flexibility than in the, in the school nutrition programs. So a uh, seamless summer option cannot be operated in schools that are only for students enrolled in summer school that is required for graduation. However, uh, in situations where summer school is required for graduation, those schools can participate in the, in the national school lunch program. They just are basically extending their meal service operation into the summer. Um, and so, so um, if the school will open the summer school site to all participants, then the school may participate in the seamless summer option. And then sponsors may continue to operate the seamless summer option after summer school sessions have ended. So there isn't that uh, necessarily the programming requirement with the seamless summer option. Okay, and sponsors also, as I just said in the, the previous slide, so sponsors can continue to operate the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program during the summer. However, they do have to be operating a summer school, school program in the state education system. So with Seamless Summer, uh, sponsors don't necessarily have to be operating summer school. In the Summer Food Service Program, there's no programming requirement, whether that be summer school or tutoring or some type of enrichment activity. But in this summer meal option, if a school is participating in the school nutrition program by extending the meal service into the summer, there does have to be um, a summer school program. Uh, in order to extend the school nutrition program. And only the students that are enrolled in the summer school program may be served and it's up to age 21 and those that have not yet earned a high school diploma. And um, schools can serve any combination of breakfast, lunch, and or an after school snack. So any of those, those combinations that are available during the regular school year through the school nutrition programs. So students are charged at their eligibility rate for the current school year. So that means schools are claiming uh, by eligibility category free, reduced, or paid. And um, reimbursement rates are paid at the current year's rates by, by eligibility. And that is updated July 1 of each year. Participation is recorded on a roster or point of service uh, software system. And then there is the uh, requirement for on-site review of lunch counting and claiming for each site that is due by February 1st of each year. So this does apply to the, the um, school nutrition program. 
Meal pattern for the school nutrition programs during the summer months. Uh, schools can follow either the can follow the lunch uh, meal pattern, the breakfast meal pattern, or the after school snack program. So these are all the meal patterns of the school nutrition programs. You can't, um, you don't have the option to to use the summer food service program meal pattern because it's a completely different uh, uh, child nutrition program. So basically, you're continuing uh, what you did during the school year, with the exception you're just serving meals during the summer. So there are, of course, mealtime restrictions, just like there are during the school year. Breakfast has to begin before 10 o'clock. Lunch has to be served between 10 and 2 p.m. And snacks must be served after the summer school day has ended. So if summer school uh, goes from 8 o'clock till 12 o'clock, um, and maybe lunch is part of that summer school day and is served at 11 o'clock, um, you would then have to wait until after 12 o'clock when the school day ends in order to serve a snack. So we have a chart up here that just shows some of the meal options and it shows um, uh, during the school year what meal service options are uh, for the school day, after school, on weekends, holidays, breaks, other non-school days, unanticipated closures, and you can see uh, CACFP at-risk after-school meals uh, is an option for every single one of those scenarios. Um, one of the things that I think it is important to mention is that um, schools can participate in the summer food service program or the seamless summer option uh, for during periods of unanticipated closure. You know, sometimes there's teachers teacher strikes and um, you know or there's a, a snowstorm or a blizzard and so basically what happens is it's kind of in a it's basically in a, in like a blizzard this would be an emergency situation and sponsoring organizations of course would have to notify uh, the state agency Kansas State Department of Education that they want to participate in the summer food service program during unanticipated school closures Okay. Uh, summer vacation then, an option during summers, summer vacation for weekdays, weekends, federal holidays, summer school days, um, that's the summer food service program or the seamless summer option. Laura, do you have anything that you want to add at this point with um, something that I might have missed regarding this chart or anything else about CACFP at risk? No, I don't think so. I think the key is that uh, CACFP at risk meals can be served on any day during the regular school year. So I think that chart covers it. Okay, good. Yeah. After school is After out. the school mm -hmm. day or on school day outs. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, I, I am just curious, are, are Laura, and Laura works very closely with um, CACFP at risk, but are we seeing more school sponsors participating at risk and serving like during spring break or during uh, like, like holidays? I don't know that I've seen schools that are serving necessarily during breaks, but I have seen an increase of schools that are that are participating after school. Yeah. So they're they're um, and they're adding suppers. So that's the unique thing about CACFP is is the option to serve a full meal, and so that's what we're seeing a lot of schools going to, um, as opposed to the after school snack. Um, through NSLP because um, with the snack being only two components, mm -hmm. um, some some districts are feeling like a full meal will benefit their their uh, students more so than the snack. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're seeing more of. I think is is um, serving those kids after school okay. and not necessarily during the breaks. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's definitely in a step in the right direction. Yeah. So then, Laura, what? just tell us a little bit about what that actually looks like. So if the school wanted to serve a supper meal, what are some things that you're seeing? Because you go out and you you visit these schools that are participating. So just give us some scenarios. Yeah, that so, like. so you talked about with the summer food service program, you can do a hot meal or you can do a cold meal, and that's very similar with at risk. We don't specify what what the meals really have to look like as long as they comply with those component requirements. So I see a little bit of everything and it really depends on the, the site's uh, ability to provide either staff or facilities for preparing meals. So uh, I have a rather large school district that uh, they have their staff uh, prepare 
um, basically sack meals during their normal hours of work, uh, like in the afternoon before they get off work, and then they're, they're packaging them and they're putting them in the coolers then for the staff to have after school. And then I, and then I have a, a school district that has chosen to keep their food service staff after a handful of food service staff after the school day is is out so that they can actually prepare a hot meal in the in the kitchen and serve it on the line just like they would okay. during the school day so uh, really it's up to the district and their abilities to have um, either staff or facilities to be able to to prepare those those meals so we we really have a lot of flexibility and we do have sample menus um, for both hot and cold menu items that are available on our website mm -hmm. right. um, to assist sponsors. So um, very similar to the summer food service program where we really have a lot of flexibility and we're seeing a lot of different scenarios. And Laura, what are the kids doing um, during that time? What are some programming? What are some activities that, that they're on site? Doing? Yeah, yeah. the most typical activities that we see are some after school tutoring. So that's a pretty general uh, offer that the schools have so where if kids need to get help on their homework or um, if there's specific teachers that stay to help the students so tutoring is a very common uh, common activity that I see um, a lot of school districts especially when you get to the middle school and high school levels have different club activities going on after school of course the sports programs uh, so you see you see students that are participating in all kinds of different different things after their school day and and uh, and it looks very different too so some some schools will have the kids go ahead and eat their their snack or their meal in a congregate setting like like a cafeteria mm -hmm. um, and then they go to their activities um, some schools have the have the students come to the central setting to receive their meal or snack and then they allow the students to then go to their different activities okay. um, on the school grounds. So again, there's a lot of different things that happen um, just depending on what sorts of things are going on after school um, as, as um, to determine where the kids are going to eat. Okay. Um, and so there's flexibility with that as well. And flexibility, I think, is definitely the key. And I always like to kind of describe it. It is, just, again, it's so similar to the Summer Food Service Program. It is definitely not a one-size-fits-all, and it really is based off of the needs of the that organization. Yeah, that's correct. And really, you know, it, and you see a lot of different things depending on whether it's an elementary mm -hmm. setting or a high school setting. That can look very different as well. So, yeah. yeah. Pretty, I, I think we have some sponsors that are doing some, some innovative things, would you, would definitely. you say? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, let's move on. And I know we, we talked about uh, out, outside of the school day, but I kind of want to circle back to the school day because I don't think that we can, can have a conversation about student wellness and academic success without talking about breakfast. Because breakfast truly is a smart investment for student success. Um, there is just so much research out there regarding breakfast. And um, we know that it uh, boosts students' academic performance grades and test scores. It helps students concentrate. It helps them be more alert. helps with comprehension and memory. And I always have to laugh because I always think, well, you know, I don't really necessarily know that I need a lot of research to tell me that if I don't eat breakfast, I'm not going to be able to concentrate because I think that's something that's, that's readily observable and experienced pretty easy by anyone if they don't eat breakfast because, gosh, by 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just not functioning at a uh, peak. Um, but anyway, um, but that's good though to know that how our, our experiences um, are supported by research and not to minimize the, the value of that research. But um, also too, breakfast consumption has been shown to uh, improve classroom behavior, reduce absenteeism, tardiness, and visits to the school nurse. And I really like to focus at this point on absenteeism because if we've got any educators listening to this webinar, we know that there's a strong link between absenteeism and graduation rates. Um, and so that's very important. And, and although I love to say, well, you know, if you offer breakfast and every single student eats breakfast, that, you know, that's going to help ensure that every single student graduates, um, that may not be the case. But we know that there is a lot, um, uh, obviously, a strong link between breakfast consumption and decreased absenteeism, which then again 
uh, anecdotally could um, uh, increase uh, graduation rates. So just I've just got a few uh, slides with data here that I just want to share with you. And um, with this one, breakfast eaters score higher. So breakfast eaters scored significantly higher in spelling, reading, and math when breakfast was eaten. And we all know that teachers, um, administrators, there's a lot of pressure to, to um, help students succeed and do well with standardized tests. And you can see that um, the, the blue bar is um, indicates the breakfast skippers, and the orange bar indicates the breakfast eaters. So um, it's very easy to see that breakfast eaters um, do much better. I also liked this slide because this talks about um, the frequency of eating breakfast. And you will see that for those students that seldom or never ate breakfast, they were twice is likely to um, to to get below average grades. So I think that's also a very um, speaks very strongly to the the benefits of eating breakfast. And so um, I would just want to end the conversation about breakfast with a expanding access to school breakfast and just get on your radar if it's not already out there to consider innovative breakfast delivery models um, in your school and that can include breakfast in the classroom and a grab and go breakfast option or a second chance breakfast with breakfast in the classroom the students are eating breakfast together in the classroom with the teacher uh, with grab and go, grab and go can be, you know, there's a, a kiosk set up, you know, in the commons area um, of the school where the students can grab the grab a reimbursable breakfast and sit in the hall and eat or go to the classrooms and eat or they can go down to the cafeteria, grab their meal and, you know, go to their class or go to wherever they like to hang out at before the school day starts. And then the second chance breakfast option is one that we've seen really take off this year. And actually, all of these innovative breakfast delivery models have um, have really taken off this year. We were fortunate enough to have a, a, a breakfast grant opportunity for our schools here in Kansas, and that um, opportunity will continue on into fall of 2019. But with second chance breakfast, students have an opportunity to get a reimbursable breakfast meal um, after the first period ends. Because we all know um, if you have high school students or junior high students or even as adults that sometimes um, uh, we like to sleep in until the very last minute or sometimes traffic causes us to be running late if we're adults and sometimes it can be very difficult to eat breakfast and so by offering students second chance breakfast options so after the end of the first period but before the second period it um, provides access to a healthy breakfast meal for students. Um, and so I hope that you'll consider some of these um, innovative delivery models. And you can see that these are some pictures of second chance breakfast options from some of our uh, high schools here in Kansas. So we're really doing a lot of great things in Kansas regarding innovative breakfast and our um, breakfast numbers have skyrocketed at this uh, school year. So we're really proud of the, the success of our um, school sponsors. So with that being said, um, we hope that you will think about um, all the opportunities that exist for sponsors to provide year round meal service and then consider how your school or your community can increase access to nutritious meals for Kansas kids when school is not in session. We um, talked about um, the at-risk after-school meals outside of school hours, the summer food service program, the after-school snack program. So there are several different options that, that that will more than likely fit your need. Um, and um, just also to know that, like we said, that um, you know these programs are not a one-size-fits-all, and there is certainly opportunities for creativity and innovation um, to maximize student learning and ensure student success, both physically, mentally, um, and uh, academically. And so we just hope that after you have listened to this webinar that um, you'll be so inspired to go back to your district and start a conversation with uh, the, the folks in your district about how you can offer meals um, outside of the, the traditional school day. Laura, is there anything that you would like to add or wrap up with? I don't think so. I think you 
you covered it well. Okay, well, thank you. And if you have any questions, I noticed that I don't think we got our information up here, Laura and I's personal information, but this is the 785-296-2276 telephone number is our number here at Child Nutrition and Wellness. We've got a lot of resources uh, on canny.org, but if you have any questions, please feel free to call our office and ask for Laura or myself. We'll be happy to answer any questions and help you with um, uh, exploring your options for incorporating additional child nutrition programs in your schools. So thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and um, please reach out to us if you have any questions about any of the slides um, or any of the content that was covered.